Welcome everybody um, to the 12th edition of the Art of Assembly as part of the School of Resistance. And um, uh, we are very glad to be a meeting tonight. Unfortunately, the last two episodes already had to be postponed, uh, hopefully not canceled further, but uh, postponed because, well, of known reasons. And this one is not happening analog in Ghent as we planned it, but at least we meet online. So I'm already, already thankful for that. Uh, and I'm very happy um, to have as guests tonight Isabel Fremont, Jay Jordan, Tasha Wojcik and Milo Rau. And my name is Florian Malzacher and I'm uh, curating and hosting the series, uh, The Art of Assembly. And maybe just a few sentences for those of you who haven't followed the series. Uh, the Art of Assembly is um, a series um, by Brut, uh, Brut Vienna and me uh, initiated to investigate, but also to speculate on the potential of gatherings in art, activism and politics. And uh, we started now pretty much exactly a year ago. And um, if you missed past episodes, I want to check them out uh, on our websites are videos of the inputs and the lectures and podcasts of the whole editions. And I think we covered quite a wide field of this topic in very different angles. Um, and still this edition is quite a special one, as I said, Art of Assembly is part of the School of Resistance and School of Resistance is part of Art of Assembly tonight, which is a nice twist. And I'm really thankful and excited about this collaboration uh, since I think there's a certain kinship in our approaches. And um, I think it also makes sense, of course, very much to, to link this. So thanks a lot to everybody behind the School of Resistance and also to the team of Antigent for making this possible and hosting this evening. Um, the topic tonight we will talk about is really very much in the center of how the series started, uh, coming from the observation of all these assemblies happening within the art in a time, in a decade, where also um, assemblies became uh, more widely known, I think, uh, uh, due to the, all the square occupations, the movements uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, they were practiced, of course, much longer, but suddenly there was a different focus on them. Um, so numerous theme theater makers and artists have been inspired by the concept and the performative reality of assemblies in recent years, uh, creating, directing, initiating trials, parliaments, um, congresses, summits, and assemblies in white cubes and black boxes on proscenium stages, public spaces, etc. cetera. Um, but the relationship between theatrical and political representation remains complicated, I guess. So we will talk about it. What are the difference and proximity between physical presence within an art institution and on, for example, an occupied square? Um, so I actually remember uh, when together with Jonas Stahl and Jonas Varsha, I was initiating a, a Congress and Assembly uh, in 2014, uh, Artist Organizations International, where also uh, Jay and Milo were there as well. Um, but there was uh, somebody saying, ah, you have to turn everything into theater. And this was not meant as a compliment, obviously. So it was uh, from an, my activist side saying, okay, Basically, you make everything worthless, a reverse Midas touch. You make art of it, you make theater out of it, and then it's it's not useful anymore. Well, I would uh, understand where this is coming from, I and I would agree that it makes theater out of things. I would still would um, not consider that personally as necessarily a bad thing. We will talk about it. But indeed, I guess there's a crucial difference. The activist, and often anarchist assembly is... Uh, often considered a space of authentic negotiation, a space for trying to abolish established hierarchies, for not only trying, but living a different way of decision making. While I guess the, uh, the assembly in theater might sympathize strongly with those ideas, I would guess it has an essentially different take. Theater is not only a social, but always also a so self-reflexive practice even so many conventional theater approaches kind of ignore this. I, I think theater is a paradoxical machine that marks a sphere where things are real and not real at the same time. And it proposes situations and practices that are symbolic and actual at once. It does not enable an artificial outside of pure criticality, but it's also not able to lure 
its audience into mere immersive identification. So the social spheres, the assemblies it cre can create, offer the possibilities of partaking and at the same time watching ourselves from outside. So in this regard, one can say that Brecht's alienation effect is actually not an um, invention, but rather a discovery of what all theater, what, uh, con uh, what consist constitutes all theater. Uh, just not all theater. That was, a, that was spectacular. I hope you're still there. <laughs> so the liveness of this, <laughs> this event, <laughs> just to prove it's live. Um, so what I, what I was saying in a way is quite simple, but quite complex, that theater is real and not real, uh, actual and symbolic at the same moment, which produces a paradoxical situation. But I believe, I mean, it's not so original in a way, because in a way it's a Brechtian thought, it's something that enables this double take of being part of something and at the same time being able to reflect on something. So this construction, I think, is maybe what theater would have to offer in a way. And I guess Milo will talk about it and we will talk about different ways um, about it. Um, but it's also a problem, of course, as I said, making theater out of everything. Uh, and it leads to di possible, uh, possible disagreements also there. That's the more aesthetic side of theater I was talking about. A whole other chapter again, and we will also talk, I guess, quite a bit about this, is the institutions of art. So it's not only art itself, but it's also the institutions that um, that are owning art, disseminating art, organizing art in a certain way, and bringing their problems with them. Also, problems of making it part of the market and certain discourses, etc. So um, we will talk about some of these things tonight, and um, we will start with Milo Rau, who is. Uh, obviously initiated an abundance of projects. Um, so it does not really make sense to pin him down only on one strand of it. Anyway, a little bit for tonight would like to do that and focus uh, on your tribunals, uh, trials and assemblies that you have been staging. Um, these works have been quite an inspiration for the series because they are works of art and at the same time want clearly to intervene in the reality that surrounds them. Um, that is their quality, but perhaps it's also their problem in, in line of what I was saying, um, and that's something we will discuss. Then we move on to Kasia Wojcik, uh, who is the one of the persons behind the School of uh, Resistance, which maybe already marks something, so there's not one person to be able to represent. It's obviously a different kind of effort. Milo is also part of it, but this time this we ignore for the moment a little bit. <laughs> and um, the School of Resistance uses theatrical settings, but understands itself as activist, not as an artistic project. So uh, this may be also a slight paradox we will talk about. And Kasia, who is a dramaturg, poet and artivist, will talk about her, their work, but also why she believes that art and arts institution can actually be useful for activist struggles. And last not least, I welcome the activists Isabel Fremont and Jay Jordan uh, from the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. And I guess already the name tells it all so, uh, by bringing together imagination and insurrection. And they, they live in the Z uh, in France. And you will also talk a bit more about this in the moment or in your contribution. And they very clearly and often and very beautiful have stated so believe if you truly want to do politics, you have to desert the institutions of art uh, and entangle insurrectionary imagination into the every li everyday life of movements. So welcome everybody. Um, I will a little bit more introduce everybody before the input. Everybody speaks about 15 minutes. Uh, Isabel and Jay have prepared a video. And uh, after that, we all come together and we'll talk about it. Uh, so Milo, um, Milo Rao is not only a theater maker, but also a filmmaker, sociologist, writer, journalist. And before he made his entree into theater, he spent years reporting from conflict areas such as Northern Iraq and Syria. In 2007, he founded the International Institute of Political Murder, which in addition to theatrical productions, films, videos, and performances, also publishes books and organizes debates on social and political themes. And since September 2018, you are the 
uh, artistic director of Antigent, which is also hosting this evening. Welcome, Milo. I'm really happy you are here. Also, we were talking actually for almost a year about that you should be part of the series. So I'm very happy it works out tonight and the floor is all yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Florian. Uh, it's, it's a big pleasure to be uh, with you here. Uh, yes, it should be in Ghent, but it doesn't happen in Ghent and it will perhaps next time happen in Ghent, but at least it is, uh, is co-hosted by us. So, um, I mean, what you said in the, in the beginning in your introductory speech uh, is for me quite interesting on how I think we look on assemblies and perhaps I can expand a little bit on that, that on the one hand, uh, especially we uh, German speaking uh, guys, we are very pro alienation effect. And on the other hand, we want to overcome the alienation effect. So we are always when we are talking about assemblies and what this gathering theater where you look on something that you are enacting in the same time what you ex exactly are in that moment is, is, is very questionable and this is, is taken in these dialectics I would say of escape alienation and kind of searching for alienation to step out of the immersion of the uh, I don't know of, of however we can uh, we can name it as a as a wrongly understood life and wrongly uh, did practice so um, before I was a, a war uh, correspondent and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a writer, and uh, before I then started to theater, I, I started as an organizer of, of big manifestations for in Switzerland for the young socialists. And uh, the other big question always was, how would you bring, for example, on the 1st of May, or when we were protesting against uh, the neoliberalization of the universities or other topics, how would you bring together different parties, different groups from uh, anarchists to classical trade unionists to one uh, event. And how would this event happen? And how would this event go through a city? And how does it end with uh, speeches and everything? I think, Kasha, you know these uh, problems very well also now when we are doing the first live school of resistance. So how is this all uh, organized? Just a political uh, assembly. And, and later I started doing theater. And of course I was uh, um, experimenting this, this, this uh, format in, a, in, a, in, in, in black boxes. You were mentioning the, the, the trials and the, the tribunals. Um, and uh, um, I, this started in, I think in 2013 that I did the first uh, trial. So it was called the Moscow trials. Uh, I can come to this because it was the first time I did it a bit by an accident. Um, and I will try to understand, uh, going through some of these projects in the next uh, 10, 12 minutes, uh, how can uh, an assembly, uh, an aesthetic assembly, because it's still theater, that's true, that's perhaps the difference of what we will hear later in this, in this meeting, um, how can it uh, represent reality, how can it reflect reality, how can it change reality, and how can this change of reality be sustainable? or can go on when the so-called project, art project is, uh, is finished. I think one of the, of the big questions of social engaged um, theater makers. So the, uh, the Moscow trials happened a bit by accident, I would say, because I was invited to do a reenactment of a Stalinistic trial uh, of the 30s. I went to Moscow and there I was immersed in the whole scene of activist artists at that time uh, it was a bit before everything was freezed. So, um, for example, I met uh, Pussy Riot. It was before they played in the Holy Savior Cathedral. And it was a group and they were just playing here and there like many other artists too in Moscow. And, um, but I understood that uh, when I do a trial, it shouldn't be a reenactment of an old trial because I was giving a, a conference like this one uh, about the trial against Bukharin in 37. And then somebody said, but it's exactly the same situation uh, like today, but today it's against artists. There were two exhibitions that were made in the Sakharov Center that were uh, destroyed by right-wing Wendels, right-wing extremists. And then uh, the strange thing was that not these uh, extremists were put uh, in front of a, of a tribunal, but the makers of these, uh, you could say, uh, uh, more leftist, modernist, postmodernist, as they say in Russia, um, exhibitions. So I decided to remake these two 
um, tribunals against these artists. Um, and when I was in the middle of doing that, this uh, big scandal uh, uh, around Pussy Riot happened. And I remember that um, somebody was telling me, Milo, uh, this, is, this is the third one. So you should take this one uh, too. So Katya, she was not sent to, to prison. One of the Pussy Riots, I invited her to, and I invited all these artists. And, and this is what you could call an antagonistic model and their enemies. So let's say that the right-wing people, the, the orthodox people, uh, to restage this tribunal, but in real life, following Russian law inside the Sakharov Center, where these uh, exhibitions happened that were destroyed. And for me, that was point one, how to bring together these people, how to represent this society that only reacts on each other. And uh, I, I constituted a popular uh, jury and the tribunal happened during three days with a lot of, you can see that in a film, with a lot of little interruptions. So it was attacked by the Cossacks, it was attacked by the, by the, by the secret service. And uh, the outcome was uh, in dubio purio. So it was like uh, uh, three to three with one uh, exception. So um, they were liberated. And of course, this was the first time that I was asking myself, I remember in the moment when the jury was retired and I was sitting there with, with, uh, with Pussy Ride and the other uh, artists and activists and asking myself, but what would it mean if the, the outcome would be the same, like in reality, what, is, what would have been possible? Um, we did more tribunals in that style, one in Zurich, for example, in my hometown uh, against the fascist newspaper. Um, they won, so that's the problem. The fascist newspaper won the tribunal. Um, and um, and uh, the third one, and this became a new format, was the Congo Tribunal. So it's a, and, and it's the first time that I created something that is not only an antagonistic representation of reality or trying to bring whole society together in one room. It was creating what we call a, a symbolic institution, so an institution that should exist but doesn't exist at that moment and will stop to exist when a real, um, a real institution will start to, to exist. So we gathered uh, advocates from uh, Congo and from uh, international law advocates together to put uh, on trial uh, the international mining companies, so Swiss companies, companies from Canada, uh, that are exploiting at that very moment uh, the eastern and the south region of the Congo, where you can find the biggest uh, um, resources of, of coltain, of cobalt, of gold. So what they call strategic uh, strategic minerals, because they are very important for, for example, the IT, IT industry. And uh, we started in Eastern Congo to do this tribunal. Uh, and we went on, this tribunal became quite fast independent from us. So last time in December, I was in, uh, in Kolvesi, so the world capital of cobalt, um, to make a tribunal against, uh, against uh, uh, Glencore, the biggest mining company. And at that moment, I was only as, as part of the, the jury. So the Congo tribunal, you could say, went completely into the hands of the uh, of the of the house of, of of Congolese advocates and some international advocates, so it became an independent uh, um, institution, but still uh, symbolic in the way that uh, an international economic tribunal doesn't exist because there is no uh, law that would be the basis of it. Also, this law we had to to create. The interesting thing, besides the fact that we could uh, attack uh, enterprises, the UN, uh, uh, the Congolese government and other players uh, that are, there is no tribunal where you could attack them, uh, was that something super complex like world economy could be brought together in, in one room. So that's something that always interests me to, to have, for example, a manager of a mining company uh, somebody from a group army, from a, from an armed group, from a, from a, from a guerrilla, somebody from just a worker in the mining industry, somebody who was pushed for Miss Earth, a little peasant, and so on and so on, all together in one room to following the law, um, um, representing world economy in different cases. So that was the, the Congo Tribunal. Uh, it's ongoing. 
um, we tried to last time we connected it to the to some initiatives in different countries in Europe to make these uh, transnational companies accountable in their home countries. So we lost the initiative in uh, in Switzerland, but it's ongoing, and we hope that in the next time that uh, there is a vote, we can uh, we can push it a bit more, and it will it will happen because it was it was quite near and. Um, but still, the sustainability of these kind of projects is quite uh, unstable. Um, so uh, I, I want to come to the last uh, project that for me was super important, or perhaps two. I have, I think, three minutes more to the uh, to the revolt of dignity, uh, which was based on a on a Jesus movie we did in uh, in Matera in South Italy. Um, what would happen if Jesus would come today uh, to the south of Italy and the situation there, uh, so this capital of culture where we did it, according a bit to the film that uh, the Italian maker Pasolini did uh, 50 years away, um, is, is, is very absurd. So you have this European uh, capital of culture and around, you have the reality of, of, uh, of South Europe. Uh, so you have 100,000, some even say a million of illegalized uh, migrant uh, workers on the on the tomato fields that are exploited by the big companies, by the mafia, etc. So we tried to connect the making of this film and the creation of a kind of a overall solidarity between uh, uh, the, 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 the workers coming from Africa, the Italian uh, little farmers, uh, the trade unionists and all kinds of groups to create an overall movement which we depicted in the film as the movement of Jesus. And the interesting thing is that the outcome of this film were, were three things. So first thing we said, who plays in this movie has 10 documents and becomes regularized, becomes citizen of Europe. So that, that's what happened. And then we said, we want to have what we call a microecology, so a whole distribution system that now uh, what we did, we used the film as a, you could say a propaganda tool to uh, sell these tomatoes produced by uh, the Jesus of the film, Yvon Sarnier and, uh, and his colleagues, his apostles, uh, to sell it in 150 independent little uh, shops in, in all over Europe. So what happens is that by this film, these people started to produce tomatoes. By producing tomatoes, they get papers. By getting papers, they can sell the tomatoes. By the money that comes back, they can own land and they can produce more tomatoes. And it became a kind of a circle, um, an alternative uh, economy, you could say, that at, until the, that moment uh, liberated almost a uh, thousand um, or regularized almost thousand uh, migrant workers that could step out of the in the film depicted by a system of, of, uh, of, of, of mafia exploitation on the big fields in south of Italy. The, the second example, and I think I have one, one minute left, um, because it's a bit the new branch we are, we are in, uh, is, the, is the, what, what happened in Orestes in Mosul. So I made it as a, as a kind of classical theater play, as a co-production of uh, the Entegent and the Fine Arts Academy of Mosul. So with actors from Mosul, the, the former capital of the Islamic State, and uh, and actors from, from Belgium. And we produced it in Mosul, but uh, it was completely impossible to tour it. So the actors of, of, of Mosul would only be on, on, on video. And uh, I said to myself, but that's a bit nonsense after all this uh, collaboration to just go on tour of a play. And together with the UNESCO, we could produce or found uh, in, this, in this time as an outcome of this project, the film school in Mosul. And the idea of the film school again is to use, uh, you could say, um, the capitalist distribution system of culture to construct cultural infrastructure where you wouldn't expect it, to liberate people. So what they will do, they produce now the nine first films in the film school of Mosul that we will, through a film festival, try to bring in the international circuit and by this refinance the school and produce more films in Mosul. So to produce a parallel system 
of uh, of representation and production of uh, of uh, of of art and i think that's a bit the way i wanted to uh, to describe from representing a situation like russia 2013 changing a situation um like it happened in the congo tribunal where ministers were dismissed thanks to the to some of the witnesses of the tribunal some of the cases uh, we represented to uh, micro ecologies or some also call it micro e e e economies of uh, of a sustainable way of um, of producing art in another way uh, thank you very much Vilo. um you could have had two more minutes, no problem. The longest 15 minutes we had so far were 40, I think it is serious. So if you, everybody who stays around 20 is perfectly fine, just for the following up. Thanks a lot. Uh, we will talk uh, uh, all together about it afterwards. Uh, so I would now like to introduce uh, uh, Kasia Wojcik, um, who is not in the image yet, but probably will appear in a moment. Um, I will not introduce the school of resistance now um, uh, because you will do that uh, in, in your, your, your talk. It's a it's a, a project and initiative by the International Institute of Political Murder and Antigent. And uh, Kasia is uh, together with Eileen uh, Banken, uh, Martin uh, Valdez Stauber, and Georg Blockus, uh, senior curator of the school of resistance. And she's a dramaturg, poet, and activist. Um, in this context, maybe just in the context of the series, also to mention, also related to Staub zu Glitzer, uh, dealing with the Volksbühne, which uh, we were talking about in October in, in the 10th edition of uh, the Art of Assembly. And uh, since 2017, uh, you are part of the IIPM and you were co-curator of the General Assembly which Milo now uh, unfortunately left out, but we will talk also a bit later about that uh, in 2017 and co-campaigner for the new gospel in 2020. Thanks so much, great to have you and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Florian. Okay, mm. everybody can hear me, I hope. It was the birthday of a great teacher this week, Angela Davis, and I would like to start this uh, grounded embodied lecture as I call it with a quote by the Marxist philosopher and political activist she is. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. Theater is a magical tool. I do believe one can say that new forms of political interventionist theater that create reality and change reality by connecting reality are emerging and I find it quite beautiful. The Chilean Colectivo Las Tesis, uh, that was also guest in our School of Resistance, with their performance El Violador Eres Tu, spread like a wildfire over the whole globe, sparking the imagination of a global collective inspired by the radical revolutions happening on the streets in Chile in autumn 2019. We could connect all of this if we want to, to the history of interventionist art over the last 100 years. Um, the Russian avant-garde with people like Nikolai Evreinov during the Russian revolution, but also action art created in the 1960s. And I think our school of resistance is just situated in this very complex but interwoven net of activists, but also artistic practices and methodologies. School of Resistance uh, started in May 2020 um, as a joint project, as I was said by IAPM and the Antigent, right after the outbreak of the pandemic, um, with the online speech of the indigenous artist and activist Kay Sara, um, the green of the Brazilian forest behind her, and she sent out an urgent message to everybody listening that this planet is on fire. Some days ago, the close friend of a very dearly loved person was murdered in Colombia. Albeiro Camayo, another indigenous leader on the Latin American continent, defending his community and Mother Earth that he and his community are so dearly connected to in the last centuries. I would say we live in accelerated times and we live in compromised times. 
what started as an online debate series has in the meantime grown into a multidisciplinary, multi-visioning and visioning day event uh, in which artists, activists, philosophers, and engaged citizens search and uh, envision a more sustainable future for our common planet. A symbolic institution, as Milo just described, which is global, decolonial, clearly feminist, and intersectional. The questions we are asking, how to live in this world as a multifaceted poly polyphonic humanity, and what kind of knowledge do we need to gather and assemble, and yes, assemble for a solidary future? How to understand the deep connections between the climate crisis and the human right to migrate and to use the freedom of movement? How to conquer authoritarian ideology while also creating new radically democratic spaces? What can we do? But let me first introduce myself to you before I explain to you in detail the experiments we created and encountered in the last one and a half years. I'm speaking to you today about assembling political power and using the magical tool of theater and art. Because first of all, um, I come uh, from a migrant working class background of the Polish political diaspora in Germany. And theater was never the space where my family and our community went. I think because in Germany, it's still very closed for a certain class. And I got to know the power of theater through our public school system. So as part of the, I call it Hogwarts generation, theater, art, and poetry became my own personal tool for survival in a time where the world started to enter in new times of crisis. Planes flying into skyscrapers when I was 11, deep racism, killing people and terrorist attacks in my own country, like in Halle and um, also in Hanau and a renewal of authoritarian and fascist ideology entering the global political stage. Second, in the beginning of my twenties, I became a dedicated political activist in various progressive movements and initiatives. Although as part of the generation Y, I missed the whole Occupy movement <laughs> because I was still too much engaged in the neoliberal dream that I grew up in. And I participated in my first political rally for the right to the city for all and migrant rights in 2013 in Hamburg. Um, afterwards, San Pauli, the district of Hamburg where I was born, was declared a danger zone by the local administration, declaring left progressives as enemies of the state to fight against. In 2017, four years later, I experienced my first collective trauma with my allies in the G20 summit in the exact same city I was born in. I suffered through stages of severe cynicism, of being tired, of political engagement, of deep anger and rage, but also persistence, long comradery, networks of solidarity and growth. In the last years, my friends and comrades were radically asking, how can theaters become active spaces of civil society again? Who can enter these spaces? Who do city theaters and national theaters belong to? And I think School of Resistance sees itself as one of the many experimental toolboxes that are currently being created to radically open up the theater to communities of solidarity, of care, and of knowledge. So after getting to know me now a little bit, I would like to introduce you to School of Resistance, um, the last one in Cologne, where we tried to assemble political power by using theatrical as well as performative tools. Um, under the slogan for politics of justice, we entered or were invited by the Schauspiel Cologne on the weekend of the German national elections last September. As connecting already to what Milo said, um, through our campaign with migrants and illegal workers in the Project New Gospel, we as the IIPM created our own distribution channels directly supporting illegalized workers in Southern Italy, closely cooperating with activists and trade unionists, and months of really heavy connecting, 
daily Zoom meetings with progressive German NGOs and also in Europe, helped us to connect to campaigns in the German scene, linking even members of the European Parliament to our cause and having a close creative session with Leave No One Behind, an NGO in Germany um, that was created after the burning of Moria on the Greek island of Lesbos. So how could we join forces to intervene in the highly energetic summer of the German elections? Um, I remember it was a time of frenzy and energy also in our team, <laughs> but we ask these questions. Um, how can the system of dehumanization, illegalization and exploitation of migrants in Europe be overturned? And in a big collaboration with different actors like Seebrücke, Sea-Watch, Poisil, we connected to the campaign Human Rights Are Non-Negotiable. And we released a commonly written manifesto, the so-called Cologne Declaration for a Policy of Justice and Humanity, signed by over 80 public figures right before election day. And we created a joint fundraising campaign which supports human rights lawyers to bring responsible politicians and officials to court. I think I could say that we really did explore in a big alliance of the civil society new possibilities and potentials for the convergence of art and activism. Locally, we connected the School of Political Hope to the School of Resistance, a lot of schools emerging, um, that organized a city entangled workshop program. Um, we organized three hybrid panels with experts of change from the Congo to Pakistan to Lesbos to Kassel. And because we are a school, our program of people's education in its, I think, truest sense, we ask the how questions again. How can we build social movements and create tools for civil disobedience? But now, what's next? <laughs> because my favorite political slogan is, after the rally is before the rally. <laughs> so after all our last events in Munich, Berlin, and Cologne, the School of Resistance is landing now in the Belgian city of Ghent. Um, on March 4th and March 5th, you're dearly invited, all listening. We will coordinate together with Ghent on the Grenzen, the In My Name campaign, and La Coordination de Son Papier, which um, hunger strikes last summer in Brussels, the undocumented refugees in Ghent who will voice their political will. How can we make Ghent a city of solidarity and even a sanctuary city as local initiatives are trying to build it up? And who are the citizens of Ghent today? Who is the citizen to enter the, the anti Ghent? And we will experiment with different workshops on art and activism, connecting also to local climate activists to actively decolonize our knowledge, as well as give the stage to undocumented artists. We believe that self-organization and representation of the disenfranchised and illegalized is our political goal of the coming years. And the European elections of 2024 are maybe another symbolic moment we can maybe wrap our minds around together. Political exclusion and disenfranchisement of workers need to be overcome. This means also the idea of voting rights for migrants, regularization of illegalized citizens, and the radical opening of political institutions. As a theatrical project, we can reimagine democracy and try to bring it back to its core of community, solidarity, and care. Centralizing the question of the political subject uh, in a global society, as we already tried in the General Assembly 2017, is crucial. And we, as the School of Resistance, think that at some point, the campaigning logic of the civil, civil society will fix what the state doesn't want to fix has to transition into a very clear political conquest of institutions, as Milo wrote once in a mail. <laughs> And because, let's be honest, we tried everything, occupations, conferences, campaigns, it is not enough. And we need to deconstruct and reconstruct ideas of political representation, but also create the political conquest of institutions. And I'm coming to my end now. Bear with me. <laughs> 
March through the institutions was coined in the 68 movement. But how about hacking institutions, playing in its true theatrical sense with institutions? How can we enter public spaces like theaters or cultural institutions and shift and shape the hegemony of public discourse, but also create new communities of care? We have the space. Look at the castle that is right now being rebuilt in the middle of effing Berlin. It is huge, so much space. <laughs> so what can art do and what can't it do? We can generate creative methods for political movements. And I think Jay and Isa are more active on the ground specialists for that than me. But we are thinking right now in our networks about legal creative strategies and how to intersect art, justice, and activism. If you have anything on your mind, please write us. <laughs> and I do believe, and I think my colleagues believe the same, that art gives us the utopian space to think the impossible and improbable and the poetic creation of the world and our relation towards it. And we are all relational beings. We relate to the materiality of this planet. There are no rules and no boundaries like artisans. We can shape imagination, thought, and even feelings. And this could be our possibility to overcome the dogma of there is no alternative of the late 90s, which I'm a child of. Artistic knowledge can be a true tool for the radical transformation of the world we want to live in. And I think it, for me, it's a world of solidarity, care and community, justice and friendship. So my last lesson I would like to share with you now after five years of engaged political art and activism, keep up the micro work. <laughs> every conversation, every new relation counts. You don't always need a huge audience or a scandal. Be patient with the small steps, the persevering relations, the patience of common creation. It takes time, although we don't have the time. So believe in your own micro work. And now ending again with a quote by one of our teachers I started at the beginning of this lecture. Angela Davis, again, you have the floor. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the fucking time. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for this. And um, yeah, I'm uh, already really also looking forward to talk about how, how hackable institutions actually are and what your experiences are with this. Um, so yeah, we will talk about it in a moment. Uh, thanks a lot. And now I um, would introduce, well, first, not the last speakers, because uh, Isabel Fremont and, uh, and Jay Jordan prepared a film to give an insight into the Z and to the work and to the assemblies. Um, Isabel Fremont is an educator, facilitator, and author. She was a lecturer uh, in the Bur uh, Burbeck College University in London. Uh, in, from 2001 to 2011, before deserting the academy to apply herself to movement building. She co-authored, directed the book, film, uh, uh, the La Sentier de l'Utopie, sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, most recently, uh, the uh, beautiful book that I can just recommend, We Are Nature Defending Itself, Entangling Art, Activism and Autonomous Zones, which just came out and together with Jay Jordan. And Jay Jordan is an art activist, author, part-time sex workers, full-time troublemaker, labeled a domestic extremist by the UK police and a magician of rebellion by the French press. And uh, JJ has spent three decades applying what he learned from theater and performance art to direct action. They founded the direct action groups Reclaim the Streets and the Clown Army, worked with the cinema cinematographer for Naomi Klein's The Take, co-edited the book as uh, we are we are everywhere and um, lectures in theater and fine art and um, is also uh, in a way an ambassador i would say or uh, in 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 many art contexts or i don't know i would call infiltrator ambassador uh, so actually a guest very often speaking in art contexts about why uh, art institutions suck so um i'm really happy to have you here and um um we will see your film and talk about it in a moment then
We begin with compost. That swarming multitude of microorganisms. That seething, teeming soup of aliveness, which transforms everything in its grips. Death into life, life into death and back again and again. Compost. It's a chemistry of carcasses that transforms all who inhabit it. Flesh ingesting and digesting flesh, life rotting and shitting, but always bringing forth prairies and forests, food and flowers. It's a chemistry to which we will all eventually return. Compost comes from the Latin com, with, together, post, from ponere, meaning to place. To place ourselves together. This is one of the reasons we begin to talk about the art of assembly with compost. But it's not the only one. In many ways, assemblies are the beating heart of the laboratory of insurrectionary imagination's practice. We see them as prefigurative rehearsals and trainings for revolutionary process, for creating worlds without competition and domination in the here and now. Since 2004, we have brought artists together with activists to co-design and deploy creative forms of disobedience. We don't call our practice works or pieces or projects, but experiments, and every experiment is self-organized through consensus decision-making, where everyone is part of the process of collective design. Consensus, to literally sense together, to feel something together. Consensus is the opposite of voting, where the majority get their way and the minority have to just accept to lose. Consensus is a process of listening to everyone, and synthesizing each other's feelings and ideas into a solution that all can actively support, or at least can live with. Consensus is never easy because no one spectates. For it to genuinely work, everyone must contribute and believe that collective intelligence is in reach. At times, we have brought this process into the theater itself, turning the stage into an assembly, but never as a thing in itself, never just for the form. For us, the assembly is a process to break down the toxic binary between audience and performers. An assembly by its nature is something to participate in. It is not a show, not something to watch. Instead, we want to give people a taste of cooperative practices. But the most important part is to make a collective decision that leads to a disobedient action outside of the theater. When an assembly is no longer going beyond itself, when it is just an experience and not a space from which actions can be made, then it loses its raison d'être and becomes hollow. As most of these acts were illegal, we don't have footage of the assemblies itself, but two experiments stand out for us. For Crash, a post-capitalist A to Z at Arts Admin in London, the audience arrived directly on stage, which was filled with dozens of wheelbarrows with long handles, a lot of plants and other strange equipment that looked like a kind of survival kit waiting to be activated. The audience were presented with a clownish-like training in consensus decision-making by characters in black leotards before sitting down in a large circle ready for the assembly to begin. Someone explained the set. The pimped wheelbarrows which were designed to transform into a mobile camp with tents and gardens that could be set up and taken down quickly. The questions for the assembly was, do we want to take this camp into the nearby financial district and set it up for the evening, even though we have no permission, making it an act of disobedience? Every night, the audience debated and ended up deciding to leave the theater and disobey. A member of the crew did the facilitation, the crucial craft of listening and synthesizing. Like all the best performances, facilitation requires a deep sensibility. But unlike most performance, it demands a total relinquishing of the ego and an opening up to the collective desires of the participants. Facilitating consensus is a form of channeling. It is the alchemical art of assemblies, distilling the collective sense and differences into a creative solution. A temporary camp was set up squeeze between the skyscrapers of London's financial centre. This was 2009. 
two years before the Occupy movement. Perhaps the experiment was a kind of poetic prefigurative vision of a movement that would bring collective practices and camps to financial districts across the world two years later. In 2012, we brought another audience on, into an assembly on stage at Camp Nagel in Hamburg for What is Enough? Where following a legal briefing by lawyers, the audience were asked whether it was ethical to go out to the theatre into the city, armed with ants to sabotage computers and put them into the banks that finance fossil fuels. But that's another story that we don't have time for. Of course, the assembly said yes and went into the city. We love theatre, but we think that today the best theatre happens outside of its walls and stages. Its beauty is found in the streets and fields, when everyday life becomes entangled with art. We're living in an era marked by a system whose obsession with limitless growth means that until there is some kind of radical system change, it will always place the economy in front of life sucking the living into its globalised circuits of capital, forever expanding and voraciously devouring more and more worlds. For us, the role of art in the disasters of the capitalist scene is not to show the world to people, but to transform it together. Our most successful and meaningful experiments have always been deeply embedded into self-organised social movements, where we work as organisers and artist-activists co-designing actions. It can involve organising a pirate treasure adventure to find buried boats and launch a regatta to shut down a coal-fired power station during a climate camp. This can mean turning hundreds of abandoned bikes into tools of disobedience during the UN Climate Summit to protect an assembly of indigenous and frontline climate justice organisers from police violence. It's all about taking their force away you know, distracting them from the crowd, to keep the crowd safe. 200 people walked out of the conference to come and try and join us. Um, unfortunately, they, they, the police were just too violent and, and wouldn't let them through. All arrested, all by Um We ran into remnants of another swarm after that, um, and again, all but two arrested. <laughs> We have memories of so many dramatic assemblies during these movements, making decisions that had real historical impacts. Imagine a hundred people sitting in a circle deciding where to hold the UK's second climate camp, which would involve thousands of people squatting the site of a climate crime and for a week setting up a self-managed camp with hundreds of workshops and mass direct action at its end. Some people wanted to squat the site of Heathrow Airport's proposed third runway. Passions were high. One person is in tears, convinced that the army will be sent in if we touch Heathrow. We take turns to explain our positions or ask questions. We discuss visibility, political impact and local endorsements. We will never forget that moment eight hours into the debate when the facilitator finally asks, do we have consensus? And a hundred people wave their hands in silence, signaling their agreement. We have consensus. The next climate camp will take place at Heathrow. The room erupts into loud cheers. We still feel the hairs on the back of our neck tingle as we recall this moment, a moment that made history. The runway is still not built. We see why theatre makers love the intense drama of assemblies and why they want to bring it into the dark box of the theatre. Yet for us, this is what vampires do not what artists should be doing at this moment of history. Sucking the form out of political movements to feed a cultural career is what so many so-called political artists are doing despite the crisis of these times. So much creativity is put into building empty mirrors of this dying world rather than constructing ways to resist and build other worlds. We're living in a time where it is easier to imagine the collapse of life as we know it than reinventing the right ways to live together. No artist or activist has ever had to work in such a moment in history, and yet our culture continues to turn its back on life. Business as usual is the order of the day, especially in the museums and theatres of the metropolis.
Perhaps the best term is not vampire, though, because vampires don't have a choice. Artists do. Perhaps we could call these practices extractivist art. Extractivism takes nature, stuff, material from somewhere and transforms it into something that gives value somewhere else. That value is always more important than the continuation of life of the communities from which wealth is extracted. Artists' careers are built out of sucking value out of disaster, rebellion, animism, magic, movements, whatever is a fashionable topic at the time, and regurgitate it into an unsituated, detached experience elsewhere. Anywhere, in fact, as long as the codes of the world of art function. But whom do such pieces serve, ultimately? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN climate scientists, not known for their revolutionary spirit, wrote in 2018 that if we want to avoid the worst of the catastrophe, we had 12 years left for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. We must revolutionize so much of our existence and fast. This must include art. Why make an installation about refugees being stuck at the border when you could co-design tools to cut through fences? Why a performance about the dictatorship of finance when you could be inventing new ways of moneyless exchange? Why make a dance piece about food riots when your skills could craft crowd choreographies to disrupt fascist rallies? Why bring an assembly on stage as a spectacle rather than design joyful ways of making decisions together to be used for social movements to be more resilient? We are talking to you from a place that taught us many lessons about how to live a shared life. A place that French politicians used to call the territory lost to the Republic, but that we who inhabit it call the zone à défendre, la ZAD, the zone to defend. A place where decisions taken by ragged assemblies of activists, locals and farmers won against the French government and one of the world's largest construction multinationals, Vinci. The ZAD is on the western edge of Europe, on the spine of two watersheds, on the edges of the village of notre dame de Land, near the metropolis of Nantes. Here, living life in common became a weapon against an airport and its world. We don't have time to recount the story of this 40-year-long struggle against those who dreamed of building another temple to hypermobility, another extinction machine, another airport for the city of Nantes. But the resistance began with local peasants in the 70s and spread. During the assemblies of France's first climate camp here in 2009, Local inhabitants invited people to come and squat the land. To defend a territory, you need to inhabit it, they said. And that's exactly what happened. Over the years, an autonomous community emerged, with its bakeries, pirate radio stations, tract repair workshops, brewery, banqueting hall, medicinal herd gardens, a rap studio, dairy, vegetable plots, weekly newspaper, flour mill, library, and even a lighthouse built where they wanted to put the control tower ZAD became a concrete experiment in taking back control of everyday life. In 2012, the French state's attempt to evict the zone was fiercely resisted, and neither police nor government officials set foot there again for six years. About 80 different collectives were established and over 350 people shared life together in the way of the bulldozers. The state had gambled on that old story that rulers need to tell themselves, that people without strong governors, weaponized police and prisons will inevitably destroy themselves and fall into chaos. In their imagination, this would be the Zad's inevitable fate. Those six years were no Shangri-La. There were recurrent conflicts and crises between people with very different visions. But everyday life, with its mess and complexities, had to be self-organized, collectively and as horizontally as possible, through affinity groups, working collectives and assemblies. 
while continuing to organise a movement against the airport. To sense the movement's differences, picture a long assembly co-organising one of the actions to conjure away the airport. Over 100 people fill a barn. Dairy farmers sit next to anti-species vegans, tractor-driving libertarian communists who would provide tons of communal potatoes or opposite primitivists, refusing to have any petrol vehicles or even agriculture near their dwellings. There are feisty retired women from the local towns besides spaced-out barefoot hippie runaways. There are deserting engineers and ex-convicts, drunk punks with dogs and fluffy ecologists, black bloc anarchists next to an ex-mayoress. And these assemblies were some of the most theatrical we'd ever seen, with huge moments of tension, with everyone on the edge of their seats because we were literally organising a movement that meant life or death. Not only for this territory, but for our bodies too. Within the movement against the airport, this ecology of struggle is referred to as its composition. Instead of trying to resolve differences, it requires each component to try and work together to pursue common desires that go beyond what we thought was possible alone. Through the encounter of differences, there is a process of contamination, whereby all change each other. Farmers become squatters, and squatters become farmers. Locals are radicalised, and radicals become locals. This process is far from easy, but when a composition works best, it reflects the self-organising balance of conflicts and mutual aid, competition and partnership of organisms. In an ecosystem's short term, everyone is eating, digesting and becoming compost for each other. Life is a constant flux of breaking apart and being remade. But in the long term, only behaviours that enable the whole ecosystem to flourish are amplified. Whether it's a prairie or an ocean, a forest or your gut, each interrelated part meets its own needs while creating the conditions that support and transform the whole. In the ecological commons, writes Andreas Weber, the individual can realise itself only if the whole can realise itself. Ecological freedom obeys this form of necessity. The deeper the connections in the system become, the more creative niches it will afford for its individual members. Perhaps we should call the movement process a compost pile rather than a composition. In a compost pile, everything is cross-contaminating. Nothing is pure. Making movements as compost is taking the risk of doing things together, not just sitting around talking about radical ideas. These wetlands from which we speak continue to become wetlands. Farmland continues becoming food-producing land. Assemblies of inhabitants and users of the land continue to take place. The airport will only ever be a negative shape, a ghost of the extractivist empire. Holding back the monoculture machine, decolonizing a place from capital, opening it up as somewhere that enables forms of life that to connect and unfold, that is what is beautiful. That is the aim of an art of life, an art that lets life live more. Thanks so much um, and welcome back everybody. Um, thanks, I mean, there are so many things in this video, uh, but one thing I think already probably marks a difference, maybe that's not in the core what we're talking about, but actually maybe that's the base for why we're talking about it, that how much assemblies actually are embedded in everyday life. So an assembly is not something planned and worked for once in a while, but it becomes really a constant process at least that's what the film very much suggests in a way that it's like a um a practice uh that is that is 
per permanently present, which which maybe probably with most artistic uh, projects already would be something uh, seen quite differently. But maybe just to start, you already said it, but to 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 kind of connect a little bit when you were talking about. Um, Vampire art. Uh, it might just reminded me that Brecht was talking about cannib cannibals theater, where in a way something similar he described. He said like taking the stories of workers and putting them on stage uh, basically uh, means um, misusing them again, uh, extracting from the workers again. Uh, so so there's a, maybe a connection to that. But I, I wonder with, with this clear stance that you had to, towards uh, this work, um, do, do you believe still that there could be some value, value in some of the, in this logic of as if in the theatrical space, in what in a way Milo's symbolic institutions are on the border of, so they have a, a branch in, in reality and in in, in uh, political activism or in real politics, but also they have clearly uh, a stand within the symbolic realm. Uh, do you do you think that, that that's of any use or just um, <laughs> that's a waste of time and uh, let, let's uh, go somewhere else? <laughs> well, the answer is always, it depends, of course. I mean, we don't want to make generalizations. I mean, you know, we, we do have a foot in the theater spaces and the art spaces. I mean, we, we, we haven't really deserted. Uh, we do try and dance between the two. And we think that those spaces are, you know, they are public spaces. Uh, mostly they're, you know, funded with public money. They are our spaces. They are our spaces to transform and create. And, you know, I think one can be involved in radical practices within those spaces. Uh, I think one thing we realize though, is often it involves letting go of your cultural capital and that's quite complicated for artists and especially for artists who actually uh whose living is entirely based on those kind of practices economically living uh but i think you know i think we think that sometimes you know that artists are so trapped within that cultural capital that actually they can't you know they can push the legal you know the push a kind of radical agenda or something just so far and then they'll stop because they know they won't get reinvited to that institutional space. Um, so yeah, those spaces are useful, but I think we all, we often say, you know, be prepared to uh, scupper your boat. In English, there's a term to scupper the boat. When the boat is about to sink, you put a hole in it so that it sinks safely. Yeah, and I think that I was, I was very inspired by what um, Kasha was saying, and I think that this idea of hacking the institutions um, is, uh, is something that I feel very inspired by, is that because I, I truly believe that, yeah, these spaces are our spaces. And Kasha asked a fundamental question, is that who comes to these spaces? And I think that there is, when we try to really address these questions, and think in terms of hacking and actually reappropriate them, reappropriate them um, genuinely with this idea of um, not being extractivist, but really think about um, the impact it has on the communities that the material is um, drawn uh, from and on, then, then they can become um, spaces that are fruitful and, and, and interesting. So yeah, it, it depends what is being done. I think that for me, one an issue I, real, I, I have really is when the assembly is only taken as the form and is gutted out of everything that it's supposed to do because an assembly is not a form. An assembly is, is something where stuff happens um, and stuff happens when there is real life in it. It's like a compass pie. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we will um, probably these are at least two points: the question of who comes into it, and the question of the hackability of an institution. Uh, uh, we, we come back maybe in a moment. Again, I would just maybe Emilo, um, because also because um, due to time reasons, you didn't speak about the general assembly, uh, uh, which in in a way is an example. Uh, quite an interesting example. We had a conversation about it also because it most clearly resembles an assembly. Uh, also, it has a certain agenda, um, uh, and and at the same time, it's yeah, it, 
it is also an, an artwork, I guess. It's, it's also a, a stage production. Maybe could you just, uh, to bring it into the loop, it doesn't make sense that I explain what was happening there. Just say two, three sentences about the General Assembly also, and, and, and maybe also then address the question that we also discussed, what is it to be an, a director of an assembly like this? What, what does it mean being a director of it in, in terms of what is proposed? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the General Assembly that was uh, inspired again by the votes in Germany, I think at that moment, like four years before, it's four years earlier of the Cologne Declaration and the School of Wisdoms in Cologne. Um, and, and we were asking ourselves, but who sits in this German parliament? And because it's a, it's a very important parliament, because Germany is a very important economic power in Europe and and, and, and also on other continents. And, um, and, and, and that's why we were asking, but who should be in the German parliament? So it was a kind of a, of a, of a, of a way to say, uh, we have only the 1% that it's even asked, even inside Germany, you have to, I mean, uh, more than a, a million of people that has no right to vote. So, I mean, that where our question, how could you possibly represent um, what German uh, economy is doing outside uh, Europe in, in, again, in the Congo and Latin America, et cetera, how can also the, can the nature be uh, represented? So it was a question about, that's true, a, a intellectual question or a, a somehow philosophical question about a political question about representation. And it was trying to build an assembly that could invite everybody who is um, who is touched by the decisions of the German parliament. So this was the, the idea and we called it world parliament uh, for that reason. Um, and, and, and absolutely that's a symbolical institution. And I think it was um, on the one hand, it was, I would more describe it as an experiment while for example, the, the revolt of dignity is really trying to create uh, a sustainable circle so the, 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 the General Assembly was more a, a kind of an experiment to find out, but what, for example, could be discussed there. And the interesting thing that we found out, I'm just remembering now, we found out that when we are talking about world politics, normally um, it's, it's kind of, we are talking about cultural politics and how to invade other cultural spaces to prescript how they should decide on, on, on whatever while, for example, economy is still extremely nationally decided. And, and we, we, we found out this disbalance, so to say. Um, on the other hand, um, yeah, I mean, the, the General Assembly, I think that's one reason why we went from there to the, to the, to the School of Resistance and to smaller gatherings of, of how one group, I think we are more in the connecting than, than um, um, with, with the General Assembly then in the, in the, in the real holistic practice of, of, of one group. So it's a very different uh, project to, to uh, yeah, to, for example, the, 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 the revolt of dignity. It was a very interesting moment. I really, I, quite, I must say, uh, General Assembly was, in terms of these questions, of many questions of assemblies in theater, really an, a quite interesting experiment also, also with the, where, where it uh, became confrontational. So, so it was, like, I, remember, I remember the sentence of one, somebody from the audience saying, uh, which very much is in line of what was, I was saying about uh, what somebody said at the Artist Organizations International. Somebody stood up and said, uh, yeah, for, the, for you it's theater, but for us it's our lives. Uh, and, and this of course brought the whole dilemma uh, quite in a nutshell. And also your role in it, like being, an initiator, but still also a theater director as it was in the credits. And then in the situation that you had come up, we don't need to go into the details now, because, but, but a conflict was, was, was coming up that made it necessary that you stepped in, stepped on stage in this and suddenly kind of had to make decisions or to have to report also, which was really bringing all these questions of, uh, uh, of theatrical assembly to like in a nutshell to, to, the, to the fore, I think. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, there is also, there was a, a big dysfunctionality inside. I mean, you, you were describing this moment because you saw uh, problems that you will have. I mean, it's, it's kind of how would a newly created 
impossible assembly because it was the one problem of this assembly was that there were conflicting ways of thinking things that were so extreme that uh, this, this assembly all the time was very close to not survive in the next gathering. So, and uh, that was, yeah, that was one, one really big problem. I, I remember one uh, confrontation between an Armenian uh, uh, citizen or a philosopher, a Turkish uh, political figure and uh, an African uh, uh, Philosopher. So, I mean, they were like kind of how we would interpret uh, the next. It was a, yeah, I mean, I'm just now remembering it was a quite crazy experience. That's, that's true. But can I add to that? Because I remember looking at that in this moment, and Isa said it already what assemblies are not the form, but some sort of energy. And in this moment, where like there was this tumult or conflict. And the audience started to ask questions about democracy and who can speak and who can should leave the assembly and what could be said. I really, and I don't want to sound spiritual, but I felt an energy that I think is just possible in liveness. And I mean, that's the great thing when you have a big theater, <laughs> which you can fill with like 60 activists from all over the world or philosophers and then create or some sort. We didn't even create this moment. We maybe put the right people in the room, but the moment emerged itself and then it was there and then there was really an assembly moment of what is democracy and how can we decide together and i i found that quite also inspiring maybe because i uh, uh, to continue just on this if you could you were involved in the general assembly and now uh, um, you're you're uh, working on the school of resistance uh, maybe you could also discuss can uh, continuing from what you just said what what would you take out of the general assembly and for the school of resistance and what would you do what what is done differently what is what is a, a different take on it or how was there a learning process also for you from the from the school of resistance uh, from the general assembly to the school of resistance i think one of the learning processes was the revolt of dignity and um really the what milo already described as the I don't know, getting more in touch with the networks, the people, the activists on ground, really more listening, I think, and really listening in the sense of their needs. And I'm, I'm still learning, I think, but, <laughs> but for me, it was like the General Assembly was just the start of maybe a process that goes more into the direction what I think Isa and JJ also described of, of really bringing assemblies or into public space. And if we call it theater or not, but assembling change makers or experts of change or revolutionaries. And um, for me, it's just like, for me, what, what I learned the most is, and what I'm really excited now also for Ghent is really getting to know local initiatives that do great city work, because I think this is, and connecting it to global experts or global uh, activists. And I think this is where I'm really interested in where we, I mean, the whole right to the city movement of the last 10 years, it started in Barcelona, but it is also present in London and Paris and Berlin. And um, all these city initiatives do so much amazing work. Like here in Berlin, the expropriation campaign, DW and Eignen, this is radical community work they're doing. And I think, like how do we assemble this knowledge of the local with the global so it like ex it's, it's faster <laughs> we can like spread it faster that's kind of what what i'm interested in and perhaps to add um uh, one thing to the to the i think the problematic of representation is the problematic of uh, you call it extractivist or uh, vampiric um and i think it's <clears throat> it's absolutely true uh, on the other hand, what I what I learned from from sometimes when when activists and artists are working together and merging, but also working in some distance, that in these dialectics there can be a multiplication of the effect of uh, what the one side or the other side could do. And that's, uh, for example, I think that this regularization campaign that was initiated by uh, the revolt of dignity and helped by the film a lot 
was already there, but not working. And on the other hand, of course, we didn't initiate it, but coming these two powers together, this say propaganda film and this huge distribution machine that we brought with the, with the cinema machine uh, together with this problematic of being exploited on the field and having to find contracts and having to find a representation to be regularized. Uh, it, it was only in this connection that it worked and both sides were uh, were not complete somehow. And I, um, so um, when I'm thinking about it, because of course extractivism is a big problem, um, I, I see that there can be a dialectics where these, these two possible alienations uh, that the one side can't enter or hack the system and the other side is in the system and doesn't know how to use it, that this coming together is sometimes uh, really beautiful. I mean, I, I think that the, yeah, the, the synergy that we can find between artists and activists is something that we've been exploring and working with for many, many years. And I think that um, the example of uh, the film for me is exactly the non-extractivist because it really, it really thought about the impact that it has on the community and how it can change it and I think that this is where you're talking about the new gospel the new gospel yeah um is for me is is a is a brilliant example of a, of a piece of art that doesn't take stuff to um to only feed the artist's career without thinking about the impact but actually brings the two energies and the two experiences um, together and tries to really have that kind of synergy to make it more than than itself. So I think that this is where it really can become this cross contamination and and become more than itself, which for me is in a way the the definition of an assembly, whatever the form is. Like is it's a space that takes the risk um, where all the parts in that space take the risk of becoming more than themselves and, and accepting to, um, by becoming more than themselves, maybe lose a little bit of themselves um, in a very fruitful and productive um, manner. So and I think that this is what I find. This is, this is why I think that um, these institutions still can be hacked and need to be hacked because I mean, it can, it's a very, it can produce something that is a, a very basic um, principle of uh, redistributing resources. And I think that this is what we need to do, whatever the resources, wherever we are, um, it's, it's about finding ways to uh, redistribute them and making them more than what they, what they are initially. And, but I think that, you know, that, there are some frameworks that are so, I, I feel quite toxic though, still in those spaces. For example, it, it shocks me to hear you talk about the General Assembly and talk about audience. Because for us, a General Assembly doesn't have an audience. That's the, the element of assembly is there is no toxic binary between audience and spectator. And that's why a lot of our practices have always been influenced by carnival or ritual, because for us, that is the, you know, in a way to make social change, you need to break that audience spectator uh, binary. Doesn't mean, you know, that artists, artists are great at creating events and, and situations. You don't need that, that, that. I, I think we need to break that. And I think we need to break the, the hierarchies. You know, the fact that, you know, there's always the director, the, the piece is always named with a, a, pers a singular person's name. Uh, uh, and we know we all work, you know, however much we work, it, we, all the practices we do are deeply collective, you know, they're, they're, they're produced by, by hundreds of different people. And yet so often there's just one name, you know, as, as the, the creator. And, and yet we know that creativity is a, is, is a collective practice uh, and normally a practice of synthesis anyway. There's never anything new. It's, it's, we, we are simply synthesizing our ancestors' ideas. Maybe to pick up uh, because it relates to this question, how hackable are institutions actually? And I have the feeling 
there's a, so maybe we stick also because of the expertise of everybody here, we stick maybe a little bit to the theater scene because I think in the visual art, the institutions are even more complex because they are more entangled with the market and so on. In, in, in comparison to that, theater often seems to be still quite a haven of, <laughs> of possibilities. I mean, not to idealize it too much, but at least it's not uh, often not with already uh, boards that would uh, um, uh, be worried about their collection and so on. So maybe things are a little bit more, uh, more easy to shift. Um, or that would be the question at least. Uh, on the other hand, there, it's quite the demands of the, in, in German speaking countries, but also in some others, there's quite a discussion around it now, like what kind of leadership should they have? And, and of course, it usually doesn't say, let's have a general assembly with everybody, uh, uh, but at least it says, can there be a collective running it? I know the, uh, the group uh, Staubzuglitzer around Volksbühne wants something that would maybe more go into the direction of a general assembly, but it's, uh, I would say, far from being implemented. <laughs> so, so Kasia, you can maybe react to that. But but my question is actually, so, so how, how much do these institutions have to change or how changeable are they if they're not really new founded? I mean, I mean Milo, you're, you're the director of Antigent and you implement a lot of these things, but I, I guess you're not working on making a general assembly out of Antigent, or are, are you? Just first to, to answer to the question of the public in the General Assembly in 2017. Of course, it was an incomplete uh, experiment, and that's why we, we developed a lot in the, in the questioning uh, how assemblies should work. But actually what it was, it was just three days of a parliament from people from all over the world came together to talk and to make decisions on stuff. And the so-called public, you could imagine like in the in the in the real parliament they could walk in and listen to it and if they want interfere at moments it happened all the time or then uh, go away again but it was also the idea that these people that came from sometimes really far away and had no voice would not all the time be overthrown by the i don't know by the by the people from berlin so there there was also a kind of a respect towards this mm -hmm. assembly from the so called public so that's a bit more the the situation that was uh, that was there um, concerning the the antigent, um, I mean there. I mean we, I, perhaps I can also take it from the side of the public. So you have you are confronted to immediately with uh, with problems that are architectural problems. So you have I mean you you showed very well. I was for a second thinking, is this the main house of the antigent? <laughs> <laughs> when you were showing the this Italian stage with the balconies, and um, and um, yeah, so that's how these ha houses still look. And of course, we are working with formats, hybrid formats, formats outside, formats in our black uh, rooms, and then we exchange. Of course, we play a lot of time. The public is on stage together with uh, with, with with what is happening. Um, so you can play around a lot. So that's the one side of, let's say, the situation uh, itself that you create campaigns, hybrid formats, discussions, uh, days of uh, ongoing assemblies like this event that would happen now in the in the Minamir. So in one room where we can cook and you can discuss and then we can have at the moment the School of Resistance and we, uh, and we go on. So these more long-term uh, gatherings of, of people with, with many formats, or now we are doing a festival with all our friends from Foröt and from Campo. And uh, so you go from one to the other and you look this and you look that and, uh, and mixing everything because even the genres are not gathering in the, in the, even in the theater. So you have the opera and then you have the kind of the city theater, then you have the children's theater and so on. So to mix this, Completely. I mean, I could go on for a long time because I'm <laughs> I'm quite new in the institutional world and it's still very interesting uh, to me. But uh, let's say democratize um, or I don't know how to, to call it uh, ways of uh, deciding that everybody uh, present in an institution, for example, um, can be heard to make this institution uh, richer um, is what we are uh, doing since the beginning with a lot of tricks that try to overcome, for example, in shifting 
functions that when you are an actor, then you can also be a dramaturg and you can be a director and you can be uh, at one moment uh, part of a political assembly so that you would not in the institution you are fixed on your on your position. So that's a, that's a bit, yeah. And many, many more examples where I stop here. It's a- but, uh, but of course, I mean, it's interesting because of course you, you also represent uh, to come back to something that Jay said before, uh, you represent an institution which is a famous artist, basically, uh, and and you also are involved in different institutions, and you're also the director of it. So some, somehow you also you 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 live and work with this contradiction that you also embrace, I guess, to a certain degree, because it's your modus operandi. Yeah? You also integrate a lot of it. Then it's so so how 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 do you feel, uh, or do, do you ever have the feeling that you actually would give up or think it would make sense to give up the role you play uh, as a director, but also as a certain person in the symbolic, in the real and the symbolic hierarchy? And would that be possible or something desirable for you? I mean, it's it's, it's possible inside uh, inside all the now you went. Now the, the but the internet is still there. So let's see. <laughs> 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 I have to explain. I explained before that uh, storms were announced. Uh, oh, wow! And, and, and electricity cuts could happen in in uh, uh, yeah, close to the second part of where I'm now. So um, it happened. But well, just don't just don't worry. Continue. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, uh, symbolic space is a bit more difficult to for me to to understand and to grasp. But let's take the, the institutional space. Uh, for me, it's the first theater I'm, 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 I'm leading and I'm not born to be an artistic director, but I said, okay, when I go inside an institution, I will take it as an experiment and I will try to change it as much I can and make it as much also transparent uh, as possible that everybody would know what happens and why it happens, etc. And I think the last step, of course, is uh, when I arrived, I said, okay, I will be there for a number of years, I said five years. Uh, I think now with Corona, I will stay a little bit longer. But I think that it's like with the symbolical institution, you always have to work uh, that you don't feel anymore. I mean, that you can, uh, or that you kind of, this change you want to, to introduce uh, is not necessary anymore. When I arrived at the end again, it was, it's a it was a beautiful house, but with a fully white ensemble with star actors. And the kind of a cut, uh, uh, let's say, uh, relation to the to the society, to the city, to the politics. And I said, okay, I want to open all those wide open that society can come in again in the city theater because it's the theater of the city. So that's what I what I uh, what I try to do and um, where I want to go uh, further. But I, in the end, it's very clear that I have to disappear uh, uh, in let's say some not so many years <laughs> then that was it for the end again and for me i mean it's uh, yeah on the other hand i also feel solidarity and it's difficult to disappear for example when we take the the uh, the new gospel i mean every day i'm i'm having one two three phone calls with our activist friends from south italy and then we bring the tomatoes there and we bring the tomatoes there we try to push it here then we do another show of the film in this in a, in a church in many churches here and there and here and there so when you are once involved you 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 continue so it's also very difficult i i think to 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 go away and i i think that i mean somehow it's the most uh, radical practice again what what you are doing uh, in the sat to just say okay that's somehow that's the center that's the place and uh, everything that happens happens in this uh, in in this world and that's yeah that's uh, that's that's another radicality so I'm um, I mean yeah being being director still is a bit, or artist is still a bit facambondage, and it's, uh, I, I don't know how to, to really bring it together. 
I won't poke more. And just, actually, just to, as a technical thing, in case I'm disappearing, uh, um, then we we'll just continue for a couple of minutes and uh, enjoy and finish at some point, please. Because I have no idea how the internet is working without electricity here, but it seems to do so. <laughs> um, but maybe to uh, continue, Kasha, with uh, with your experience uh, with with uh, with the art institutions and theaters, and maybe also in working in different places. So, so as I said, you're also part of a group which we talked about in the series already that has quite radical demands for Volksbühne, but is not really involved in it. So it's a bit demands from the outside, uh, which are probably the most radical. Uh, on the other hand, you're also um, living with compromises, I guess, every time you, you work in an institution. So, so what compromises uh, are you willing to accept and how far do you really imagine that institutions could, could change in the, in the direction that we were talking about? So I just want to share the, the, the crazy discussions over the last years I had with um, my dear colleague and friend and mentor Eva Maria Berci and uh, my comrade Zara Waterfeld, <laughs> who have very differing views on the whole idea of funding and money, because in the end, that's it when we're speaking about distribution and redistribution and also city theaters in Germany have immense money. Like the Volksbühne has immense money it, that can be used. And um, I mean, the contradiction probably is what kind of money you use for what. <laughs> and I think that's also a little bit the hacking. So in the end, I mean, we, we have to question why, I mean, already also German universities, but also German theaters are funded by economics, like econo economic partners. So we have, of course, money that is also public money is also we like we know what money is. It's it's an energy, but it is also corrupted. And um, so I think these are the contradictions living in 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 this world. So having radical demands for a collective opening and also leading of a city theater, and also then using the money that the state or city gives to you, but then also using funds and money, of course, of funders. And um, I think this is a big contradiction where I'm still thinking <laughs> and we're all thinking. Um, but other than that, I would say, um, just speaking about the radical opening, or as you said, the critical kind of mass that questions the, the city theater as an institution and wants to create an institution. I mean, that's the only thing that Staub zu Glitzer 2017 tried to do with the transmedia performance um, B6112. So it was just, okay, the city reclaimed it and said, this is our space. We can use it and we can do whatever we want with it and we can organize it. And we can organize ourselves because as Isan Jay said, in their also film, I mean, it's, it's what we learned as, as collectives and as a humanity. If we want, we can really organize ourselves. And I think I'm just, I'm just happy that the anarchist I am, I'm, I'm entering these institutions <laughs> and people are like, I'm just also very happy to, to enter these spaces uh, because I think, um, yeah, we, we see it with, with activists from all over the world in Russia in Belarus in uh, Colombia, people, and artists and activists who have radical views of how to, to change the world, or also Isan Jay talking about what is happening on the ZAT and also in other collective um, campaigns, it's also dangerous. And I'm happy that I'm right now as privileged as I am of doing the work I do and trying to also bring two stage people or into the center of the work we do that are not so privileged. Like, I don't know, we have this very great protagonist who will also come in March to Ghent, Parvana Amiri. She's a poet and activist from Lesbos. She's a young refugee um, woman from Afghanistan who's a writer. And um, I don't know, I just, through the networks we have, we, we, we are connected with her right now that well that we want to publish her poems. Um, we want to invite her and just giving us a, a stage to a, an underprivileged artist maybe. And then we can question again, who's curating what and who's deciding what, and we, we all want to decide together, but it's probably the experiment we're still living in. I hope I was not too flowery. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I mean, I, so, Jay, yeah. yeah, but just one thing about, you know, hacking an institution. I mean, you know, we know very well that institutions have feedback, all powerful, a powerful institution, any powerful group, any powerful collective, any powerful assembly uh, will have very powerful positive feedback loops. I, you go in and you become influenced by that group. You become, because you want to stay part of it. I mean, it's, it's an inevitable thing. Um, and, you know, and we can see how, you know, the last post sixties attempt by radical movements to become political parties, then in, uh, enter parliament and Germ the German Greens being the classic European example of this process, you know, how, you know, you, you start off thinking you're gonna hack the system and you end up actually being part of it. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, for us, we've always said, stay on the edges. You know, ha if, you, if you're neither in the, in, you know, try to, as we try really to stay on the edge, we're in the radical social movements and, you know, we have one foot in the radical social movements and we have one foot in the institutions, but we really value that edge that neither, you know, neither falling into one or the other, but keeping on that edge, which, you know, in, in, in ecological terms, the edges are always the most fertile. They're where there's the most combination of relationships between different species. And uh, I think the danger of hacking is that you become the darkness that you want to get rid of. Um, maybe um, to slowly come towards to an end, one question, um, uh, to try, maybe trying to combine two things that are on my mind and that I think also on this uh, line but, uh, that we are talking about is one, one is, of course, who, who is involved in this that Kasia was mentioning in the beginning, like who is going to, to a theater, but maybe also who is, if it's not on your own land, who is becoming an activist, uh, in, 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 at least in some places, I think. Is, is part of it. And the other thing that was discussed in the series also quite often, and that you stressed very much, uh, Isabel and Jay, the question of consensus versus something like that Milo called uh, an antagonistic situation. Uh, we we, we um, used often in this, uh, in this series the term the uh, agonism, uh, drawing from Chantal Wolf. So how much, so first of all, who, who is part of it and how can we change this actually also in the art institutions and, and how much disagreement then is possible? You mentioned at the end of your film, a quite diverse group of people gathering in this, uh, in this assembly in, on, on the set, but still it's an, it's an assembly with, with the common ground for this moment. Probably many other things would be, uh, would be maybe not negotiable, but there's a certain ground for it. So, so, so how, how can assemblies in, in activism and in art in, uh, that we were talking about deal with this question of becoming, yeah, be, be, how, much, how much voices can they include? How much uh, disagreement can they include and still work? Um, or does it, uh, it then just become a representation of disagreement? Uh, for example, in, in a theatrical uh, assembly. I know, sorry, that was a big thing, but maybe just pick pick out of it what you, you personally would be interested in. <laughs> Whoever wants to start with that. <laughs> Milo, do you believe in consensus? Um, yeah, yes and no. I, I think it was also in your film um, or it was something you said that uh, don't imagine it as, uh, as that everybody would all the time agree. No, all the time there is discussion. I mean, consensus actually is very antagonistic, I, in my humble opinion. And uh, that's, that's how I, I, for example, learned it in the, in, the, in the New Gospel, you can see it. But for me, it was in the, in the, in the, in the New Testament, the very interesting thing is that the group around uh, Jesus, so let's see this activist group, is not imploding because of the pressure of the empire, is imploding because of the disagreement of the people inside the group. So, and that's very important to, to understand that there is not consensus and the happy group of the activists and they would all be agreeing all the time. And on the other hand, you have a kind of a, let's say a more classical democratic idea that you have majority and minority and different parties fighting each other and, and, and so on. I think you have even in the smallest group, you have these different uh, parties all the time. But the interesting thing for me 
in this project is really the, the moment of in a common project integrating uh, these different powers. I think you called it compost, or I don't know, that you would kind of live together and have this friction all the time. And somehow something else uh, starts existing, which is much more intelligent than, than all these little disagreements, or you even understand that these disagreements were necessary. I mean, the whole film, The New Gospel, is about the disagreement of classical trade unionists, Gianni Fabris, and uh, a modern way of organizing uh, of these of these migrant farm workers like like Ivan, and then you have a and and in the end they somehow come together. And of course, this is a very old leftist uh, utopic idea that you would overcome antagonism but not deny antagonism. And and, and that's the, the the what what makes me think your beautiful question, Florian. I mean, I, I certainly agree that consensus is is essentially um, a, a space of disagreement and conflict. And I think that we should not be scared of conflict. We need to learn how to deal with it in a way that is not this, um, this terrible state of, um, of a situation where there necessarily is a loser and a winner. And I think that this is so much how we are educated into thinking. And I think that conflict is, um, is, is a very, very fruitful and, and productive uh, state of affair if we, if we learn um, how to make it something that is, again, I repeat myself, but when we learn to make it more than what it was in the beginning, then it can become something that is, um, that is uh, very, very synergetic. Um, and it's, it's just a matter of, and it's not about being, um, you know, super utopian, it's about learning, learning to actually um, listen, genuinely listen to the other and believe in, in collective intelligence. And I think that this is, this is what um, all the spaces can, can be the, 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 any kind of space can be the space for that kind of practice because it is a practice and it is a practice that is, that is slow and it, that can be um, at times painful and at times the most exhilarating experience that one can have. Um, but it's, it's a practice that, that, is, um, that is at the roots, in my view, at the roots of the, the changes of the world that we want to see. So we need to relearn to do things together. I mean, it sounds really um, basic, but I think that this is what really we have, we've been spoiled um, um, of that capacity and we need to relearn it. And of course, you need to have some common ground. Um, but I think that there are spaces that have shown like Occupy, for instance, was a space that showed that people have more common ground that they are being given credit for. And that when given the opportunity or when the, the opportunity is grabbed, then they actually show that they have more common ground and that that common ground is actually being denied and it's like, and it's being broken and everything is done so that that common ground is not, um, is not made, is not turned into solidarity. It's like, actually, I really think that very often solidarity is, is broken by authorities much more than uh, by, by people themselves. So it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a practice and it's a practice that can really be, um, unfolded in absolutely every uh, setting, including theatres. And I think that they are theatres, it's like I know that Vovod, for instance, have really tried to explore ways of even um, managing a theatre in, in very collective ways. And it's complex and, you know, and it's a matter of, it's trial and errors all the time, but life is trial and error. But whenever we teach consensus, we say it's, it's, it's a tool we can run many things on consensus, but there is the pirate, pirate, what we call the pirate technique, that actually there's one thing you can't run with consensus, and that's war and conflict. 
and fighting and that's part of a revolutionary pro process uh, and the pirate ships often were run as direct democratic assemblies and then when they actually went and fought got, went to get another ship then the captain would take charge for the moment of conflict uh, and we've had many experiences of where we we thought we could run consent run uh, conflict through consensus well you know and i'm talking actually struggling with authorities or actions and so on but actually you know consensus is just a tool for most things in life except war so uh, in war we can have i mean the zapatistas are the same uh, the community you know run the communities except in conflict when uh, well it used to be subcommand marcos and now it's um, moses who, who, who run the army I would just like to add two things to what um, maybe Isa said. So the so-called evolution of safer spaces into braver spaces. So because I think everybody's just really tired. <laughs> and we're like the problem with this like whole process of learning to talk again with each other and learn compromise. It takes time and all we all don't have the time right now for the healing. I mean, there's like colonial trauma there's patriarchal trauma and there's no time to heal but we need the time to relearn it again how to interact and really true solidarity and that's what I always like feel like okay but I feel like there's movement right now things are changing which makes me happy and the other second thing is um, maybe to saying what Jay said um, like to some people, you don't speak with some people. I'm sorry if someone is a fascist, I say, um, who wants to kill people because of um, the way they look or they are or they feel or they think. Um, yeah, I, I radically want to be against this person and that's my, my enemy. And um, I don't know, this is like maybe something where we're all still like... Uh, yeah, slumbering around. <laughs> What's the next stage of it all? Thank you very much. And also um, um, for the, you already, Kasha, uh, also gave a, um, um, uh, no, I don't have the word anymore, but uh, um, 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 made a bridge to uh, the next edition of the Heart of Assembly, which will happen in two weeks uh, on the 10th of February uh, in, in Zurich, analog, hopefully, and online as well, and with light, maybe. Uh, and uh, we will deal with questions of safer spaces and braver spaces. So we stay in the realm of theater and will, uh, with Edith Caldo and Julian Warner, try to investigate this a bit more. Um, so um, please come back, join us again. And thanks so much, um, well, you all for, for, for coming and, and um, contributing. And of course, well, as always, there's not enough, time, not enough time, but I think it's very clear that what you're talking about is also embedded also in your practices. So there's more to look up and get deeper into it. On the website, there are also links and other materials. Um, and I think it also shows that, well, I'm obviously not so much against assemblies also in the context of theater, uh, that also what it does also is it brings also maybe a contradiction or makes a contradiction within the theater visible, which is already breaking up open sometimes something. So I think it also actually the assemblies as different as they might be and as uh, as vampiristic they sometimes are, uh, they, they often also help to, 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 to put a thorn into the institutions. At least that would be my optimistic view. So thanks so much for being here. Also, thanks uh, to Thomas Schofs for um, doing the technical side and putting us online. And uh, hope to see you all again online, but also analog soon again. Thanks so much and good night. Thank you very much. Thank